Jesus and I want to use this opportunity to give a very special good evening and greeting to all our returning nationals who have been flooding the airport in St. Kitts and Nevis coming back for our music festival activities. Tonight we're here with a group of persons from the Department of Agriculture, from the Department of Environment, from the Invasive Alien Species Project and we will be speaking to you tonight about how we pre our project prevent invasive species, alien species in St. Kitts and Nevis and the partnership for our spotlight species, the green monkey. Before we get into our discussion, I want to inform us of everyone who's here with us on the panel. We have Dr. Kerry Doerr. She's our project coordinator, national project coordinator for the Invasive Alien Species Project. We have Mr. Melvin James. He's at the Department of Agriculture. And we also have two farmers here with us who will be part of a very engaging discussion later in the evening. They are all going to have the opportunity to introduce themselves after we hear from the Invasive Alien Species Project with a very short promotional video. What is this word alien? It's certainly not men coming out of space, but it just refers to the fact that we are talking about the impacts of plants and animal species that have come from elsewhere. All seven countries will be working to better protect our airports and supports from invasive species entering our borders doing marine risk assessments to investigate the impacts of invasive species on our oceans and creating a mobile app that can help us better manage the invasive species on our islands. Right, so welcome back again. And that, was, that short video was part of our education education and public awareness program which we have been running in partnership with the Department of Environment. Now to give you a little bit more context on what this project is about and why we are here this evening with our farmers, our stakeholders, I want to introduce Dr. Kerry Doerr who's going to introduce herself as well as bring some greetings on behalf of the director of the project, Mr. Evan Parry. Dr. Doerr. Good evening everyone. I'll be speaking in a few moments more about my role in the project and about the Invasive Alien Species Project in general, but right now I'd like to read some brief remarks written by Mr. Evan Perry, who is our project director. A pleasant good evening to our host, our esteemed and abled panelists, and our listening and viewing audience, both at home and abroad via the various modalities. In the absence of Mr. Perry, environmental scientist in the Department of Environment and project director, it's my pleasure to deliver brief remarks on this occasion on behalf of the project team. This IAS panel discussion is an element of the public awareness component, component of the Jeff project entitled Preventing Costs of Invasive Alien Species in Barbados and the OECS Countries. On behalf of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, I wish to express our gratitude to the Global Environment Facility for funding this project, as well as to our supporting and implementing partners, namely the United Nations the United Nations Environment Program, and CAB International, the Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International. This project has been contributing to the prevention, early detection, control, and management of invasive alien species, or IAS, in the Caribbean region and has been building on previous efforts. The project has been implemented over the last three years with the participation from seven regional countries. The objective of this project is to promote the prevention, early detection, control, and management frameworks for invasive alien species that emphasize a risk management approach by focusing on the highest risk invasion pathways. The aim of the sub-project in St. Kitts and Nevis is to ultimately reduce the impacts of invasive alien species on the productive sectors such as agriculture, as well as on our important local biodiversity. This panel discussion tonight informs part of the public awareness component of the project, which aims to engage the public, including key stakeholder groups, and raise awareness regarding the identification, pathways, impact control, and management, as well as prevention of IAS in St. Kitts and Nevis. It's, a no it's worth mentioning that a recent IUCN global analysis identified the many obstacles to addressing invasive alien species including a lack of understanding of the severity of the threat posed, insufficient information on the status and trends, 
insufficient technical capacity to address the issue as well as limited public awareness. The project in essence has been addressing some of these obstacles to IAS management through various interventions. I take this opportunity to commend the Department of Environment, which is the national implementing agency of the project, for its continued role in the implementation, coordination, and oversight of this project. The Ministry of Environment remains grateful to all of our abled panelists who have accepted the challenge to share their knowledge and insight on the topic of invasive alien species, specifically tonight, the green monkey and its impact on the agricultural sector. We look forward to a lively, engaging, and fruitful discussion tonight, as well as the participation of the public, so please be sure to call in. Thank you, Dr. Doerr. Now, to introduce you to our panelists this evening, as I mentioned, we have technical experts and we have very key stakeholders who have perhaps had the most interesting and problematic experiences with the green monkey, our farmers. So I'll start from my far right and allow our farmer who's here with us this evening to introduce himself. Hi, good evening. My name is Solomon Morton. I'm a farmer. I farm in the Wines Mountain area in Kayon. That is where my farm is located. Mm -hmm. Greetings all. Good night. Viewing, listening public. My name is Melvin James. Very recently, I, my contract with government ended. So I'm now freelancing. I've been director of agriculture for quite some time and co-chair at one point of the same invasive alien species project and very familiar with monkeys in St. Kitts and the challenges and all the work that has been going on. I've been at the center of it and so I look forward to a very engaging and very meaningful time with us all tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. And Dr. Doerr? Good night, everyone. I'm Dr. Carrie Doerr. I'm the National Coordinator of the Invasive Alien Species Project and then I'm also the research consultant in charge of investigating monkeys impact to agriculture, biodiversity, tourism, and households. And then I'd like to also introduce, um, we have another farmer here with us tonight, Mr. Carlson Nisbet, who's going to be taking the place of Mr. Morton shortly and also ex sharing his experience as a farmer in the Cranstown area. Thank you, thank you all. And finally, I'm Dr. Clark and I'm working on the communications aspect of this project in partnership with the Department of Environment. So we won't waste any more time. We're gonna get straight into why we're here, what's this project, and why we're trying to promote awareness in particular about the green monkey. And to do this, I'm going to invite Dr. Doerr again to make very brief statements on what actually is the IAS project and her research with the green monkey and what she has been finding out about our neighbors. Dr. Doerr. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Clark. Yes, so Doc, uh, Mr. Perry gave us sort of a general overview about the issues that, you know, we're having here regionally with the prevention and management of invasive alien species. So part of my job here was to identify the different invasive alien species present on the island. So I wrote a critical situation analysis, we called it, which is sort of the starting point for the National Invasive Species Strategy and Action Plan, which we're currently finalizing, another major output of the project. So you can see that we're wearing these shirts here, which highlight, in addition to the green monkey, which was identified as the most problematic invasive alien species here in St. Kitts and Nevis, we've also been trying to create awareness of these 10 other species that have been identified as problematic for us. So those would be the, the pink hibiscus mealybug, we have wild tamarind, the green monkey, the lionfish, black and brown rats, the coral creeper, also fire ants, as bee bush, and I think that's everybody, and the tropical bontic and the mongoose. So um, if you would like to learn more about these IAS, we've been each month highlighting a different invasive alien species in the Federation and on the Department of Environment's Facebook page and Instagram page. We've been putting a lot of information about how these species came to St. Kitts and Nevis, how they reproduce, um, what the problems are that they cause. And then I could also ask those of you who are interested in studying this more, CABI has an invasive species compendium, <clears throat> which has a lot of information about these different invasive species and what we can do to manage them here in the country. 
So as, as Mr. Perry mentioned, there's seven different countries participating in this project. St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua, Barbuda, Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, and Dominica. And each of those islands is working to better protect its borders from invasive species coming in, as well as setting up infrastructure to manage the current animals that are and plants that are causing problems for their respective countries. St. Kitts, Nevis, Antigua, Barbuda, and Barbados also have additional funding to investigate the IAS that are deemed most problematic. So for St. Kitts and Nevis, that was the green monkey. And so for the last three years, we've been really digging in and doing research to look at their impacts to agriculture, biodiversity, tourism, and households, as I said. Obviously, we could speak about this for a long time. I don't want to take up too much time, but I think for tonight's discussion, we'd really like to focus mostly on the agricultural issue. We have our farming and agriculture experts here in the island. So to speak to that directly, um, I have been working in St. Kitts and Nevis for 12 years now, originally as a PhD student. And so the two farmers that we have here, I've been working with for 12 full years, as well as 63 other farmers that were randomly selected 12 years ago for me to monitor the crop losses that they've experienced on their farm. So over the last three years, I've been following up with them, documenting their losses, as well as doing household economic surveys because we're working with really wonderful IAS experts around the world that are experts in economics, and they're helping us compile all of this crop loss data. So preliminarily, I can say that at least through the household surveys, in St. Kitts alone, we're estimating $1.2 million of EC, EC dollars of losses from the monkeys alone. So this is not fun each year. So this is not finalized, and we also have more data coming in from direct observations. So in the next six months, as the project winds down, we're working to compile this data and come up with a sustainable and scientifically informed monkey management strategy. So as we produce this document, we'll be sharing it widely and advertising it on social media platforms. So I encourage persons to keep an eye out for that, as we're really hoping that this strategy is able to help farmers with some of the issues that you'll be hearing about today. I want to ask you two questions, Dr. Doerr, before I move on to Mr. James. I noticed you mentioned green monkey. So, and in St. Kitts, most of us know it's our vervet monkey. So I would like Dr. Doerr first to tell us why she now refers to our monkey as the green monkey. It's a good question. And persons will know what you're saying if you say the vervet monkey. So, you know, it's okay, but our species of monkey is a West African monkey. And vervet monkeys are found throughout almost entire of the entire continent of Africa. So at le as little as three years ago, our species, Chlorocebus sebaeus, was considered a subspecies of vervet. So there were five different subspecies. But through an genetic analysis primarily, they've been deemed different enough to merit their own species designation. So they're now no longer part of the Cercopithecus genus. They have their own genus and their own species, and they are known as the green monkey. All right, the green monkey. And is there any other island in the Caribbean which faces uh, the same problems that St. Kitts and Nevis does with, with the monkey? Sure. St. Kitts and Nevis and Barbados are the three islands that have been grappling with the monkey issue for 400 years at this point in part because of the way that products move throughout the Caribbean, and this is one of the reasons why we're particularly susceptible to invasive alien species. The green monkeys have definitely been found on other islands. I would say most problematically right now in St. Martin. There are hundreds of monkeys in St. Martin starting to cause some serious alarm on the part of their biodiversity experts. And then there's a handful of escaped pets on islands like Tortola and Grenada, I'm hearing. so. But St. Kitts, Nevis, and Barbados are those with the most long-standing issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Doerr. All right, so before we get into the agricultural section of our presentation, I want to pause here again for a very short video break where we're going to be highlighting what we call the monkey problem, video one. So we'll pause and then introduce Mr. James. St. Kitts and Nevis shows the African green vervet monkey. The monkeys are well known for impacting the agricultural sector, and we are continuing to study that issue. But we are also working hard to better understand the monkeys' impact on our local biodiversity, the tourism sector, and local households. For St. Kitts and Nevis, 
they chose agriculture because they knew that we had a long history of agricultural crop predation from our green monkeys. My name is Dennis Gillard. I am a farmer. Okay, my name is Robin Alert. I'm a farmer. My name is Fayola Bradshaw and this is my worker, Cheryl Cranston. My biggest challenge at first, the monkey problem. My experience with monkeys has been very terrible. I have a lot of problems with monkeys. When we expect a lot of produce from the farmers to come in to us as vendors to buy, we don't have that amount of produce from the farmers. Now the videos that we the video that we just looked at details some of the experiences of some of the farmers in St. Kitts and Nevis and it's very important because as we document the experiences Kerry with Dr. Doer with her research as well as our videography videography team in terms of in interviewing the farmers and the produce, those persons who sell the produce, what we are recognizing is there is a constant with the monkey experience. There isn't any obvious solution. There are many ways in which our farmers and agricultural experts have tried to manage the monkey problem, the green monkey problem. However, we have to promote collaborative action, partnership between ministries of agriculture, tourism, environment, and of course, customers and excise when it comes to the management of invasive alien species. And I pause here to pay attention to our shirt, Detect, Declare, Protect, which is particularly important, especially as St. Kitts and Nevis is experiencing some of its highest numbers of inbound passengers because of our festive weekend. And this is a message that we want to send to everybody who's visiting us. Declare, detect, declare, and protect so that we don't bring species unknowingly to our islands. But Mr. James, I want you to talk about your experience with the uh, management project for the green monkey and the experiences of farmers from a technical technical point of view. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. And again, greetings and welcome to all. In terms of origin, plants and animals are seen as either local or indigenous or meaning that they originated from the, the island, for example, we're specific to St. Kitts Nevis at this time, or over time, plants can be introduced. So when Columbus came here, most of what they saw were just the natural plants that were Kittitian, basically. But as the Europeans cleared the, the land, um, we had a change. We had a loss of the lot of the indigenous flora fauna and they brought a lot of their own plants especially from Europe and Africa and other tropical places and so around the 1700s one of the things that the French brought here was a few dot, yeah, just about one dozen monkeys um, you would recall that the countries the islands changed hands very often between the French and the British Eventually, when the French left, um, the, the monkeys which they had as pets, they left them hanging around. Over the years, over the three, four hundred years, we have now get, gotten to a stage where they've multiplied and we have quite a number. I think our last estimates put it roughly in the region of about 60,000. Um, we never can have any agreement on that. Locals always believe it's a ratio of two to one. Well, when, I wonder if Dr. Duo could give us a clear when, estimate. When it com <laughs> comes to our human <laughs> beings, right? Mr. James, you, you, I, it's very interesting that you're giving us a history lesson. Students wouldn't, we did a presentation at the Keon High School a week ago, mm -hmm. and it was a solid history lesson, and you are, thank you for that lesson <laughs> as well. Okay. Uh, well, ever since, even the numbers, like 100 years ago, Persons in agriculture were making complaints about intrusions by monkeys. And now it's even worse. Um, what we need to realize is that every time persons plant food and lose it, it makes it much more expensive.
to produce a certain quantity of food, especially we're talking about food security, we're talking about food availability. And so farmers island-wide has had lots of issues. The department in its response has done several things. One, even before this project, we've had a program of management um, where, especially during peak periods, we have persons trapping, we're using mechanisms that kind of retard or defer them from coming onto a farm. Let me say quickly, that one does not last for a long time. The the, the, well, not just trapped in things which would cause, scare them, mm -hmm. right? Why is that? Um, like, for example, you can have um, counterfeit snakes. You, you can have a snake in, 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 in the field. But very soon, they would learn that this thing is not real. And so um, you, you, you might change that, and you might put an owl, again, because the natural instincts, these are some of their predators. Mm -hmm. But that has not been effective for a long time. Even sounds, mm -hmm. scary sounds and stuff like that. Um, what we found to be more effective is actually trapping them. Uh, because then you, ca you catch them. But again, it takes a while because um, initially they're suspicious of the, the new surroundings, right? But um, that in and of itself cannot be a total solution. The department has been involved, um, farmers and so on has been involved in managing it to that extent. There is also what we find um, earlier, and Kerry also did some work on estimating populations and determining range of travel and working out what species, what plants they prefer mm -hmm. and try to get a sense of how they would go about choosing what to read, you know. But um, again, it gives you information, but we have not been able to find the perfect solution. Before I left the department, we did some studies in terms of determining what it would cost to fence an acre, uh, make it monkey-proof. And that range at that time was in the region of $10,000. So um, easy. easy. Okay. So um, if somebody has 20 acres, they might decide, well, they're going to fence four or five, a portion, maybe four or five acres, um, with the kind of material that makes it monkey-proof, meaning that you will also add a, you ele electrocute the fence. The, the fence would be live, so they would, you know, if, if they get onto it, they, they, they'll get a, a sharp sting, which will deter them. For so how that, long? For how long? Well, if they want to come in, they will really have to take the, 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 the electrical sting. Mm -hmm. So we expect that it would be effective to some extent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of homes in certain parts of St. Kitts. When I was in South Africa, I noticed that a lot of residences had, had that kind of fencing and it seemed to have been effective, you know? So those are options. Um, yes, there is a cost to it, but um, it will keep the monkeys out. You can also contemplate zoning, which is something that has been put forward but has not been adopted. So the, the department has been, when I was there and even now, have been very active in trying to assist the farmers. And the farmers themselves have been working as well and the studies that Kerry's are doing is also aimed at informing us, informing the country generally, as to what can be done to assist ourselves. Monkeys is a real critical problem for agriculture. It because um, especially now that we're talking about food security, it adds to the losses. And you have listed there 10 or so other invasives which also cause losses, many to agriculture. Later on, I want to speak a little about another invasive which is not even listed here, which we don't even consider an invasive, and that is guinea grass. Oh, and that is guinea grass. It's it, problematic it, in well, Tiga, right? It's very problematic in that um, when you plow a Haran area now, very often it takes you about three weeks before you could put anything in the soil. So, the presence of nut grass retards your progress by at least three weeks. So, and we can speak about that very later, but I'll just wrap up 
by saying that the other role of the department, as was mentioned earlier, is border protection. Right. Um, we already have so many invasives in the country. And as we said, they affect biodiversity, they affect productivity. And so you don't want to bring any additional ones. That is where quarantine, that is where border protection comes in. And so just to encourage my people before I end, um, when we come to airport, seaport, and you're asked to declare, mm -hmm. then you should cooperate because yes. there are many things that people bring in. The pink hibiscus mealybug is said to have come into Grenada through the airport. Um, it was not declared. Um, even here, I'm a little worried about some of the things I'm hearing. I will mention it modestly afterwards. But that is a very critical route against new things coming in. But what we have here now is the monkeys, and um, we will continue to see what we can do to reduce their role so that farming could be successful. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. James. And you see he reiterated again the importance of detecting, declaring, and protecting our borders against invasive species. Some you just don't know. And 400 years ago, they didn't know that a pet would eventually be problematic to farmers and farming and food security. And now here we are, we're farmers, according to Dr. Doe's research, are losing up to one million plus dollars every year due to the green monkey. So I'm going to take it directly to our farming experience, our farmer number one, to speak about his challenges and his experiences and his management strategies mm -hmm. for the green monkey and remember we're going to hear from all of our other farmers through our calling questions just shortly so thank you very much dr clark i'd just like to say that my experience in dealing with monkeys it's uh, a book by itself in that monkeys are very intelligent very determined, and if I should dare to say crafty. Are you describing a human? <laughs> then, yeah, because the good old adage that our grandparents and the older folks would have told us, monkey see, monkey do, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the monkey species. And we have to be smart enough to understand that the problems that monkey brings to us is that at some point, if we don't take control of it, we will be starving. There could be no food security without the control of monkeys. For example, one might plant, let's say, an acre of carrot. And carrots, as we know, you get pretty thick at times. And within that lifespan of that plant, that particular crop, monkey could destroy upwards of a third of that crop. So it means that you're actually taking out one third of the food that would have been harvested and brought to the table for people to eat. So it's a serious competition with the monkey and we need to understand this. As a matter of fact, let's even take it a bit further. Sometimes, and most people, especially in St. Kitts Nevis now, are planting fruit trees in their yards. Mango tree is a delicacy, especially the army party. And for some reason, monkeys know that mankind love it. And they are trying to tell us that they love it best. So as soon as a tree begins to blossom, they let you know they are around. And they will take out sometimes 75, 80% of that crop from that tree leaving you to get the little leftovers, one or two. So I'm bringing this home because I want us to understand that the monkey problem or the monkey business is a serious, serious business that we have to address. And the quicker we can do this, the better it would be for us. I think that the situation in Europe right now with Russia and Ukraine should force us to recognize that if we cannot feed ourselves, we are going to be the victims and not victors of situations and events that would retard our lives. And the quicker we can deal with it, the better it could be for us. 
food security should be, and as a matter of fact, if you remember, if you recall the 17 goals that were presented recently, food security was number three or number four on it. So it tells you the seriousness, and yet I don't get the impression that the authorities, no apologies, are serious about dealing with the monkey problem. And these are things that we need to look at seriously and harness the opinions and ideas and mechanisms so going, going forward to make sure that our farmers can get it easy. It's not easy being a farmer. You have not only the monkey, you have the drought, you have the different pests that are invading you. So you can actually recognize that sometime in the plant to harvest of your crop, you can lose 60 70 maybe 80 percent of your crop with all these problems that are facing you and then when you reach the market you hear the other cry oh look at things are too expensive we can't buy it but it has to be that way because of the challenges and the difficulties that we have and when you plant with the intention to receive you cannot cover your losses so therefore the price has to be a little steep and the general public need to know this to appreciate what the farming public is going through I guess for now. That's a very, very important contribution in particular. I really appreciate the way you were able to link for us the sustainable development goals, the threat to biodiversity, as well as the current war between Russia and Ukraine. We are bringing together issues that affect food security. So if it isn't the monkey problem, it's the shipment of food and provision of food for our countries or it's being able to manage natural natural events like climate change, drought, and all of this, all of these compiled to make farming very problematic, yet farmers, they're very important for St. Kitts and Nevis. And I want to reiterate your point about food security and self-sufficiency given all these challenges. Now, before we move on to our next video i want us to speak a little bit both mr james and dr door about biodiversity loss and how the green monkey affects contributes to this especially because he just mentioned amri Pali, and i don't know any kittishan who doesn't love that mango <laughs> and who isn't really i'm perturbed every time i hear farmers say a monkey would pick a green mango, bite it, and throw it down. Like, it, it seems very bad-minded. Like, why are these monkeys doing this? So let's talk a little bit about biodiversity. Sure. The reason that the IAS initiative is happening in the region is because, I mean, the main impetus for it is that invasive species are, I think, worldwide maybe the second largest threat to biodiversity, but on islands, they're number one. So that was the reason that this funding was provided to our region as a particularly vulnerable locale. And so with regard to the monkey, we really have honestly faced some challenges in documenting their impacts to biodiversity. We've done, um, we did a nest predation study, for example, on Lyamiga and Nevis Peak, where every 100 meters we placed, it was a fake nest. We put real eggs inside and we put a camera trap on it, assuming that we would document a lot of damages to the eggs by the monkeys, but we actually found rats and mongoose to be the most problematic egg eaters. And that doesn't mean that the monkeys aren't eating eggs. I do suspect they're doing more of that impact low down in the villages. I think that the monkeys have been in the forest for 400 years, so the birds have likely changed their nesting behaviors. Um, we're also, we've done a year-long dietary study at Kittishan Hill because those monkeys are fairly used to persons and they're what we would call habituated, pretty comfortable with us watching them. And so we're still compiling and analyzing that data and what we're going to look at there is the percentage of their diet that's made up of invasive plants and then native plants. And the next, the final biodiversity study that we're doing right now is we're actually looking at whether monkeys' consumption of invasive plants increases the germination of rates of those plants. So we know that primates in general are important seed dispersers. As they consume seeds whole and then defecate elsewhere, they're actually transporting those seeds. So they may be helping by spreading some of our important native plants, but in terms of negative impacts, they may actually be consuming some of these plants that are really taking over, from, taking over our native plants and creating what we call green deserts. 
So it looks like, oh, look how green, but if it's all one species, then that is actually detrimental. We need to have a lot of that diversity. We really want to protect our important native plants. So again, we're sort of finishing out the project. And if we can find some small, it's a pilot project, so we're looking for some patterns, and then we're hoping that we get some additional funding to do some more research in terms of monkeys impacted biodiversity. So it's been a challenge because they've been here for so long, but they are kind of newly in agricultural areas and down in the villages, so it's likely that their impacts are probably most significant there. They may be eating important lizards, for example, in the lowlands that they've never really had access to. So things like that we still really need to um, pay close attention to and continue to research. Mr. James, I want to ask you to speak a little about agriculture and food security in particular in relation to, as was mentioned by Mr. Nisbet, this um, sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger, promoting food security, and also another key project that the and convention that the Department of Environment has signed on to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which our DOE technical experts, Evan Parry and Ms. Linnell Bonaparte, two officers from the Department of Environment, continuously link the Invasive Species Project to. So this project isn't just working on green monkeys and farmers, but it's also responding to the fact that we need to protect biodiversity and address concerns of food security. Now, Mr. James, farmers have been saying, people, residents have been saying that monkeys used to be up in the mountain. Now they're, they're literally living with us and it's problematic. And even for something like the backyard garden, which is, I know is a project that agriculture is currently working on, it's problematic because you, you even for me, everything we plant in our garden, mm -hmm. these monkeys deal with. And how do we promote food security, even through our backyard garden project, protecting our biodiversity and helping farmers when monkeys, as, as our farmers said, they're so intelligent that your description is suggesting it seems impossible to, to move forward with these um, projects. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I'm not going to propose that I have the perfect solution, um, but there are several factors. And um, I honestly think that we, the farming community, we should consider modifying some of our practices. Um, the, yes, the monkeys are more prevalent in the communities be, because um, there's some speculation that sometimes the, the, maybe the, the food in the forest, could some, some of the trees could have been affected by hurricanes and that there's a deficiency there. There is also the speculation that because we're using the forest more, ecotourism and residences and so on, that you know you were kind of disturbing their habitats and causing them to move. And I think over time too, they have learned a lot more about us. And as we said, they're a lot more comfortable. They have a particular kind of distance and they allow that kind of space. And once you don't get super close to them, they will stay around. And again, a lot of the, 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 the things that we love, they love like certain mangoes and so on and fruits generally. So that um, I think if we just farm the way we did in the past, we are going to always be experiencing significant losses. Again, the numbers are growing each year and the, the rate of death clearly um, is not as fast as birth so that you're getting increased numbers all the time. So um, taking all that into consideration and the fact that no one is going to, there's not going to be any consensus on mass, um, mass elimination. For one, it's, um, that in itself is not even sound because having been here for 400 years, they also contribute positively to biodiversity. We may not realize it, but sometimes you only find these things once you deplete the numbers below a certain level. So it's really how do we coexist? And so I think we have to think in terms of 
instead of um, maybe 20 open acres, why not shade house agriculture? Why not a smaller, well-protected farm where you could intense, do intensive farming and harvest similar to 20 acres in extensive farming? We have to consider options like those. Why not zoning? where in a particular zone you can really exclude them entirely and then allow them to roam elsewhere. We have to look at these kind of things because same kids, it bothers me. I don't think that we have started to address our food security concerns. Presently, our farmers, with our best efforts, we produce 5% of what we need. For every 100 pounds of food that we eat, 95% comes in on tropical. And the other five is what we do. And it's fresh produce. The, 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 we see how the world is struggling to feed the population. I mean, the latest that is being done now is, I call it, just to be blunt, making food in factories. Um, you have now where you're using something like um, cloning to produce meat and um, a lot of products being pulled together to make food substitutes through manufacturing. Because so much has been done with plants, genetic engineering and so on, to get them to increase the yield. But the global population is growing so much that it continues to be a challenge. We here need to do our part to feed ourselves. And I'm really hoping that in, in short order, we will invest in such a program that looks at our major challenges. And that include invasive alien species generally. Because we have over 120 pests and diseases. See, we have a few listed there. It's not all that are of concern, including the green velvet monkey. And so we really need to do something so that we can begin to feed ourselves, or as you rightly said, we will starve. Right, <laughs> and starvation, that's not something that we need to look forward to at all. Now, I, I would like you to give us, uh, Mr. Nisbet, a little bit about your management strategies on your farm. What have you done? And please don't tell me you use a dog, because I used a dog once when I had that monkey problem in my backyard. And in three days, the dog and the monkey, was, they were best friends. So <laughs> I'd like to know, what have you been doing? Especially since the monkey problem that, and the invasive species, it, it's linked to a lot of global issues that we're trying to solve. And, and, and Mr. James just mentioned it here, food security, understanding it through research as Dr. Joy is doing and through your experience as a farmer. What are some of your management strategies? Well, you raise a very interesting point, and you say, do not tell you the dogs. But the dogs are my number one defense. Really? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll show you an what, experience. What kind of dogs? Regular dogs. <laughs> okay. I'll share with you an experience I had just this morning. Normally, I try to be on my farm by six, they were about not later. So I try to be there anywhere between 5.30 and 6. Sometimes I'll run a little late, depends on what I have to do, have to do in the morning. And when I got on the farm, I recognize I have a few pups. I noticed only the pups were there. So I said, well, what happened? And there's a little gut or gully, as we would call it, that has some mango trees in it. And somebody over the weekend light some fire and burn some of the mango trees and some stuff I had and what have you, but minor for now. And I said, well, strange. But then when the dog picked up my scent, they let me know where they were. Mm -hmm. And so I looked, and when I looked, there was a big man monkey up in one of the mango trees cannot come down because the dogs are down there. And so I remember sometime last week they I was up there pulling some peanuts and what have you and 
I just miss them, and when I miss them, I heard back in the look, I saw something, I said, okay, they're doing their work. And that is my number one fence. I've tried other things in the past. I've tried the electric fence that Mr. James mentioned, and that worked for a period of time. I soon recognized that monkeys are very wise, if I could use that term. Don't lash me for that, please. But they began to dig under the wire to get in. But fortunately for me, I had the dogs let go. So when they do get under, they and the dog would have it out before they managed to get back out. So I got a relief from that because it was two things working at one problem, the dogs and the fence. And then I tried something I'd brought in from the States that I went on Amazon and I saw this device called the Deer Repellent. It gives off a high-pitched sound which we cannot hear by ourselves. But they would pick it up, it would disturb them, and they would run away from the area. I used that, and I had a great success for a while until, well, I guess the lifespan of that ran out. And because the success was there and I wasn't seeing them, I did not repeat it. Maybe I should have repeated it and shifted it in a further a next area so that they would go further and further away. And so those are my method of dealing with it. Plus, I try to move in away my farm that they don't, they will not be able to dictate or follow my pattern because monkeys are very smart or intelligent, if I may say that. Sure, you're not talking about humans. <laughs> they would, for example, a monkey would mark you and know what time you come and go and react to that. So what I would do, at times I would go up to the top of the farm and do work up there, so keep them off mm -hmm. along with the dogs. And then the next time around that same time, I moved the next area so that they would not be able to treat, to follow my movement and that keep them guessing where I am. But the dogs are my best defense. Okay, okay, thank you. That's very interesting. I clearly need to get your breed of dogs. <laughs> once I used, I'm telling you, the monkey was on my dog's back and they were running about the yard and I was like, this monkey is too smart for my dog so i'm happy we've had discussions over the years right about what to do to manage the monkey problem what's everybody's experience what works and i'm happy that mr james also mentioned that we haven't yet come up with a singular solution which reinforces the need for collaborative action we need the support of the ministry of tourism we need the support of the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Environment, Customs and Excise. We need the support of our hoteliers, persons who are in landscaping, people who are bringing flowers for sale, because these are all pathways for introducing species to our country, which alien species, which can eventually become problematic, or pathways for creating problems for all these issues that we're facing locally, which are global challenges, food security, biodiversity, protection. Now, just before we introduce our next farmer to give his experience, we're going to look at our final video for the IAS promotional series, the Monkey Challenge Part 2, and you'll hear from our next farmer. So thank you. So much, Mr. Nisbet, for your contribution. Mr. Morton, Mr. Morton, sorry, Mr. Morton, sorry for your contribution. And we're going to hear from Mr. Carlson Nisbet next. Thank you. We know that this impact that monkeys are having to agriculture is incredibly important, not only for us being self sustainable and food secure. We also recognize that calling attention to the monkey issue and directing efforts to manage the monkey issue will hopefully encourage younger generations of people to go into farming as a profession and continue to move us towards food security. Here in St. Kitts and Nevis, I'm the National Coordinator for the Invasive Alien Species Initiative, which is focused on the prevention and management of invasive species throughout the Federation. Some of the key information that we're seeking to obtain has to do with invasive species impact to biodiversity. So a major initiative of the IAS project for the next few years is to better document the way the, uh, the animals are impacting the broader ecology of the island. To our viewers on ZIZ television and those of us who are looking on YouTube, 
We are here and we're speaking about the Prevent Invasives, the IAS project in St. Kitts and Nevis. Our project, which is being implemented by the Department of Environment, is the Prevent Invasive Alien, alien Species in St. Kitts and Nevis. And our priority species for the month of June has been the green monkey. This evening, we have been hearing from our national coordinator, Dr. Doerr. Mr. Melvin James, who is a technical expert who has spent years working on this project and similar projects, monkey project, monkey management project at the Department of Agriculture. And we previously heard from our farmer, Mr. Solomon Morton, and now we're hearing from another farmer, Mr. Carlson, Carlson Nisbet, about his experience. So we're going to start this segment with Mr. Nisbet's experience and then get straight into our questions. Thank you very much. My name is Carlson Nesbitt and I've been farming for over 25 years and had a lot of problems with the monkeys. I'm one of the persons who believe that the monkey is so intelligent that it works out what it does and work around us to get what it wants. Um, I find my, my best solution for dealing with it is to spend time on your farm. You cannot be a part-time farmer and manage monkeys. You have to be on your farm regular. My last session in dealing with saving a crop, I had to be here at 6 and leave at 7 in the afternoon. You have to be in your area and do not move away from your area because the monkey will come right there while you are not watching and take what you have. So therefore, you have to be ever present. Early up in the year, about February onwards, I had 12 hours daily, seven days a week on the farm. Or we had some carrots and as soon as they were properly germinated, you find we go back next one morning, and here is about 500 plants on the ground. Bite the bottoms of this one, bite the top of that one, and pull them and drop them. And that's what monkeys do. Monkeys are very distressful. And I have benefited from spending long hours on the farm. Even if I'm not doing anything to increase production, you have to be there to protect what you have. And that is how I operate with it and was able to get through with most things. Fruits, most times is not great damages, but you can live with fruits. But vegetables and stuff like that, you cannot afford to lose a pound sometimes. And monkeys like Mr. Solomon said, we'll go with about a third of the crop. And I have had experiences with, if I wasn't there, they would go with half of the crop. And that's the way we operate there. We, we stay on the farm 12 hours a day in order to get a good benefit from what we plant. So over time, I have found out that, like everybody saying, the intelligence there was a time when the government was paying for monkeys caught in a um, farming area. And I know a guy who used to shoot a lot, and he can shoot maybe three monkeys sometimes in one shot. And I introduced him to it, and he came. I met him by the farm one morning when I reached there, before the monkeys came. And he looked around, and he saw them. And he said, OK, he'll come again. And he come again came again some time and got caught a few. And about two weeks after he came back, I saw the vehicle pack up, and I waited for the shots, and there were no shots. Came out of the bush about two o'clock the day, after being there about after five, and he said he hadn't seen one monkey. And he hung around with me for a while, and in less than a half an hour, all the trees in the area was filled with monkeys. 
And he looked at this, look at that, look at that, look at that. That's smart. And then there were some people from the army came up there one morning, seven, seven soldiers, parked the vehicle down in what they call Far Far Estate, where the um, extension offices. And they had their rifles over their backs, walking up, long gun. And I stood in the road and I laughed at them. They said, what are you laughing at? We come to get the monkeys out of here, you know, then. I said, you all thought about the wrong. Those guns are supposed to be in the back, dismantling in the back, that they don't see you. They said, what you want me to say? Monkeys, no gun? <laughs> I said, of course. No yes. And they said, it's exactly that. And there was four of them went into Forest Gut, and three went into Cranston Gut. And I went about after seven hit, and they came out in the bush after four o'clock, and, and not one shot was fired. I bet them they wouldn't see any, and they didn't see any. And about 15, 20 minutes after they came out of the bush, all the trees were full with monkeys. So the monkeys just played the waiting game? They were the waiting game all day. And that's what happened. And they never, the, the, the soldiers never came back because they said it's a waste of time. They're not going to see any. Right. And that is how they operate. There are no guns and they know the government. Right. right now there are two guys in the area where I am that is getting paid to shoot and they fired a few shots out in the area here by um, what they call a pumpkin. Yeah. Some of them was in there and as soon as the guys come, with their vehicle and park it, the monkeys disappear. Monkeys, no vehicles. They're no vehicle, they're not the person vehicle, and the horse are not the people. <laughs> Doctor, do are we dealing with? What are we dealing with here? Because yeah, that is what I'm it smiling, is. Smiling, but it's it's very it's. I just got a comment from the social media feed, and and the person she's not from here, and she said. You guys are making up this monkey thing in St. Kitts because when she came to St. Kitts, she saw all of two monkeys on the peninsula and you see mostly pictures of monkeys, etc. Don't, you know, it's like a fun thing and they Very just, they know. don't I mean, believe it. A group of monkeys run across the road and go into a tree and you know that they're in there and you can't see them. Right. They're green monkeys, they blend right in. Color of the skin, that's what they call a new monkey. Right. Once they get in there and they hide their chest, you cannot see them. Because yeah. the chest is a kind of whitish. Mm -hmm. And the whole lot, most of it is green. So they fold their hands like this. This inside here is a kind of whitey too. And they fold it like that. And you can't see them. And they'll be there watching you all day. And you don't see them. And as soon as you move, they move on to your stuff. That's working. That's been working in the Calypso neighborhood. Trying those are other monkeys that are fairly comfortable being around people, and she was working with them for five months, following them around, and they were very comfortable with her. And then we trapped a section of the troop where to you know do some individual identification so we could do more behavioral work with them. And she was there at the trap, and we trapped only six monkeys, and then we anesthetized them. We you know gave them a microchip and stuff like that, and then. I asked her to leave as the monkeys woke up because I didn't want them to see her, right? Regardless of that, she actually hardly saw those six monkeys again, but the rest of the troop no longer let her be close to them. And they weren't in the trap. It wasn't the monkeys that were trapped, so it was monkeys that were nearby watching and essentially associated her with the trapping and would no longer, after five months of being around them, were not willing to be near her anymore. So that one really shocked me at mm -hmm. their level of observation and, and um, intelligence and association with different behaviors like shooting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trapper used to trap where I had goats at one time, big open space. Mm -hmm. And they used to use a net made from the framework of two by four and um, light material over it netted material and he will feed under the trap for a week or so and then he go before they come and hide away because you want to drop this net over them and he did it once and caught 39 
and about four got away before he could eject them. And he fled again and went again to wait for them to come and did not realize that they were taking the field out and moving away from the trap. Mm -hmm. All the field were gone. So he sat a while and wait. And the troop came. And all the one look back at the rest. And one of them turned off, go under the trap, fill his two hands, and run back screaming. Because he think the trap is going to fall. And when the fifth one did it, because he's not going to drop on one. Mm -hmm. The fifth one did it. He laughed out and walked away. <laughs> he had to move away from the area. He never caught another one there. Wow. And there was one more time where a guy stole one from a different kind of trap. And one day he was living just below the real trap to where they had it. And one day he got to feed it and he got away from him. And he went back to the same area where he come from. And those traps stayed there with the potatoes or the peanuts, whatever, shooting what rats didn't eat, they steady on what, and not another monkey went into those traps again. Wow. And so, so communication, yeah. the intelligence. But we're focusing on monkeys. But the truth is, um, even guys who, um, who were, were trapping cattle, mm -hmm. they would tell you that um, once they, they you know, use these tractors, from the time the tractors come into the yeah, area, they're gone. The cattle start moving. They, they get accustomed. Once they, there's a kind of learned behavior. We can't understand their communication, but, they but they're certainly communicating, and they have a certain level of learning. Yeah, we could call it intelligence. And so that is why the, the, the systems that we use, we have to be all that kind of thing in mind, because what works now may not necessarily work the next time around. Mm -hmm. But um, we have to we have to keep trying because they are it's not yeah biodiversity is critical, but especially when it's that we're losing the food source that survival. Right. So it's very very critical. One final comment is that yes, Mr. Solomon mentioned the sound thing. It's what they call um, um, the sound that high pitch sound. The high pitch sound that. Um, you can you can't hear it, but animals can. It's a repellent. Right. Works with a solar battery. And I also bought one. And then I sourced them in the States and asked my son to send me some more. And we had them line off to the bottom of where they normally come in. And it worked for about six weeks. And instead of run away from the sound, they run into the ground, into the farm, mm -hmm. fold their bellies and run back out. So That's this so didn't mean anything, anything to them at all. Wow. And we absorb all of that and we stop using them. We still have some on the farm, but we don't use them anymore. Right. So your experiences are really saying to us that to manage the monkey problem, you have to use multiple approaches over time because they're just so adaptable yes. and they're so intelligent. The main thing is you have to be a farmer. Right. And you stay there. To manage them, coming to keep them out, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, the, the current recommendation is really for multiple strategies, yeah. because um, any one thing that deters them, they keep working at it. To get it over with, yeah. the it. Because persons have said that even with some electrical fences, they would eventually endure the, the shock, shock. The shock. Yes. and allow others to go in. Yeah, 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 right? At, that is why the shark has to be really, really At really the Echo strong. Park, um, they started jumping the electrical fence. One off and scale it. And that's what they were doing. So it has to be multiple. It wow. works now. Video from Nevis of monkeys, of one monkey walking across an electrical wire, which obviously isn't live, in mm -hmm. order to get themselves over an electric fence that yeah. was on fire. Yeah. I have a video of that. Yeah. So, so it's clearly an issue because these animals are extremely and adaptable. And a lot of them. Right. A lot of them we have moved to the we villages. Can do, we can do it. We I can do it. Move to the villages mm -hmm. so they are accustomed to people. Yeah. 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 Right. Dogs and in yards have learned to ignore them 
He called the them back their hearts out and, the and they jump from the fence to the house to the food tree. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you get nothing. We're going to open our lines shortly and I'm going to share the number with you in just a moment that you can call in or leave your comments on the social media pages here we have at the DOE social media page and Facebook page or on the YouTube page for ZIZ so that you can interact with us and in the meantime I'm going to also read some questions that I'm getting from our own social media feed. Now based on what, what has been said it seems as if any solution, and Mr. James said, we will do it together, and that is why CABI's important DOE, the project with the Department of Environment, Department of Agriculture, and all the stakeholders, it's very important that we come together and find plausible solutions, workable solutions, and that's why your presence here, Mr. Morton, is so critical. We must get Mr. Smith, <laughs> I'm mixing it up, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's so critical. And I want to remind us also of some of the communication work that we're doing. We're partnering with uh, what we call social media ambassadors, very popular influencers in St. Kitts and Nevis who have been using their own social media platform to promote this issue, to speak about the fire ants, the lionfish. We have partnerships with our secondary schools. We started at the Keon High School with the Keon High School Environmental Club where Dr. Doerr and I made our presentation on invasive alien species. And I think then is when I learned about the difference between venomous and poisonous, which is something I allow Dr. Doerr to speak about right now because we were dealing with the fire ants, I think, and the students were very impressed and, you know, speaking about what's the difference between venomous and poisonous. We, br we bring that up in the context of the lionfish because I think persons think because they can um, hurt us that then it's not safe to eat them. But venomous is when something has to inject you in order to negatively affect you. So for a lionfish to hurt you, it has to spike you with its spines. But once fishermen catch them and remove the spines, they're not poisonous. They're safe to eat. Poisonous is if you consume something and it then makes you sick. Right, so both fire ants and lionfish are venomous, not poisonous. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And yeah, so please eat lionfish. Eat lionfish, <laughs> and lionfish is delicious. And so three of the social media ambassadors that we have been using, Infamous, we have been using Mimi Armstrong and E.K. Flanders, Real Right, and they have been using their pages, posting about the invasive alien species, and the interaction is important, and it's also interesting. A lot of kittishans took some of these species for granted. Uh, even when we started the project and there was a mention of the yellow bell, the yellow mm -hmm. bell being an invasive person. Yellow bell, that's a pretty flower. Everybody has that in their yard. How is that problematic? Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. James mentioned, and I'll give you an opportunity to speak about that, the guinea grass, as in especially in relation to the coral creeper, when we were talking to the students, we said, do you know the coral creeper? And they were like, no, teacher, we don't know the coral creeper. And then Dr. Doerr said, yes, you do. The pink bush that's out there, and once it, the bee bush, once it takes hold in your farm, that's it. Now, Mr. James, just before you answer that question about the comment about the guinea grass, uh, there is a question here which says, I think um, Mr. Solomon could talk about it. The question here is, we have heard about electric fences. Are there any other examples of more innovative approaches being used anywhere else in the world in terms of managing the monkeys? Um, St. Kitts and Barbados sort of have a unique problem in that our monkeys are direct threats to agriculture. A lot of the other places where monkeys are, they tend to be like in the wild. And um, in fact, a lot of them are more threatened in that um, sometimes they use as food and um, <clears throat> the numbers are going down, right? So they, they are threatened. In our context, it's the opposite. They're threatening us, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I have seen documentaries about trapping, I have seen 
the, the concept of feeding stations, meaning that um, you as an individual provide food for the monkeys um, between the, the host area and your farm so that while they're traversing to come to the farm, they, they, they would meet feed, they would meet food, so that they, they'll be satisfied and there'll be no need to progress further. Um, those are some of the methods used. But again, um, persons have used radios. Mm -hmm. um, there's they, you, you, sound, there's diversity in the sound, and, it, it, and many of these things work. But no one method is going to work continually. Um, they, they learn fast, and um, they are also daring. They, 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 they go up to these things. I don't know if all the stories are true. I mean, they are. They are. <laughs> I, I they are. Say something here. something yeah. came to mind. I don't even know if I should say. They go are. ahead, Kim. Because are. you. I mean, you know. I'm intrigued. Yes. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that we had a really wonderful system in place when agriculture was our primary economic focus. So when we were growing sugar cane mm -hmm. as the way the country primarily made money, we had systems in place to deal with the monkeys. So both of our farmers today would have known that during the sugar industry, we would have had different states. And many, if not all of those estates, would have a ranger that was responsible right. for shooting any animals that came right. into right. the cane fields. So we actually have hundreds of years of history of mm -hmm. monkey control that really restricted those animals into the central forest, as well as the southeast peninsula, where there's essentially never been farming other than, um, I think there was one estate down there many years ago. So really, it's since we have transitioned out of sugar and into tourism, and we no longer have the provision ground farmers up high up in the mountain, as well as all the tractors and all the activity and all of the guns that would protect the agricultural apron. So St. Kitts so much, not as much Nevis in this case, since they went out of sugar much earlier. St. Kitts is really very newly dealing with monkeys in these high numbers in agricultural areas. So I do think it's important to recognize the historical context of the issue and that that's a big part of why this is such a big problem is because we have to really readdress the monkey issue in the face of our new tourism focus. So if we're not putting as much economic energy into farming, this is one of the major byproducts of that. So what I would like to see really is just a reprioritization of things. Tourism is so important and critical, and of course we live in this incredibly beautiful place that people want to visit. We must capitalize on that, but I, I would like to see a bit more uh, of a balance there in terms of recognizing we can benefit from tourism, but we also must feed ourselves because, you know, when we have these hurricanes, we learned that the grocery stores were bare, right? And, and you know, we've had large events over the last, you know, 20 years, things like 9-11 happening, and then COVID, where persons aren't traveling. So tourism can be a bit of a fickle industry sometimes. And so, it, you know, as, as everyone has so eloquently said, Mr. James and our two farmers, we must really prioritize being food secure. So hopefully we can learn from what worked well in the sugar industry and try to apply some of those techniques. Today. Now, the number to call if you have a question is 466 2666. That's 466 2666. I have another question for Mr. James. Yes, yes. It says here, not specific to the monkey issue, uh -huh. you spoke to the fact that only about 5% of food consumed here is produced locally. What other recommendations would you make for increasing agricultural output in St. Kitts and Nevis? Thank you. Um, I could hardly wait for you to finish. <laughs> um, we need to, as a country, we need to get serious about agriculture. Yep. Um, we've had a lot of lip service to agriculture. Um, when we were doing agriculture, it was mostly plantation agriculture, tobacco, and eventually sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Our people don't seem to take naturally to agriculture. It, it, it hasn't really been promoted positively, mm -hmm. right? And so um, there's, there's no prestige in working in agriculture. And you're given the impression that it's all menial work. But um, that is not so. 
In addition to that, the sustainable development goals about at least three or four of them cannot be achieved outside of agriculture, right? And we know that the, the, the major food sources in the world, they're having challenges to keep up their food for their people. And they're almost begging us to do something about our situation. As I said earlier, the research has gone into a point now where you, not, you can't even no longer depend on the soil to produce the food. Yes, right. People are now going into trying to manufacture food. I mean, you hear about plastic rice and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. They're really fighting hard to feed us. Yes, farm factory. Yes, and if we don't do something, eventually they're going to have to give up on us. And so um, government needs a specific policy where we're going to come up with a program and determine what we can produce. Let me give you two examples of things that we can do here. There's a gentleman everybody knows, Dr. Barrington Brown. Dr. Yeah. Barrington Brown has been doing some research on his own for years, where he has used, um, I think it's fresh water fish, and get them a bit acclimatized to saline water, or the reverse. I'm a little shady on it. But this is something globally innovative initially, right? And as a country, we continue to leave him to struggle on his own. It is high time that government invest in that program because it is a source of protein. Right. It's also a source of employment. And it is something that up until recently, no one else in the world was doing it. Right. The, the, the Japanese come visiting him from time to time and I can assure you that they're going back there and they're using that technology and one day they're going to commercialize it. Just like how now you don't have to go out in the ocean and catch tuna. They're farming them. And so Dr. Brown has been doing some fish farming, which we, if we take it up, we could be the first to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. So that is something critical. That is something for us to start. Um, there are things that we can do. We're not going to go into everything, but let's start somewhere. That is one example. In terms of um, the, 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 the vegetables, um, what we need to do is to provide water for some farmers. They say we have, we have a thousand farmers, so we can't provide water for a thousand farmers. Provide water for the better farmers so that they can produce in the dry season. And we need to make some bold decisions. For example, um, allow local food space in the market. I think it is a travesty that we continue to import a lot of sometimes inferior products. And the, the, the local produce is, does not get the opportunity to be sold. Let us produce good quality local stuff and reduce imports equal to the quantity that we're producing mm -hmm. so that the local farmer can be able to sustain himself, improve his production, and develop a sector because it is the only way we are going to be truly independent and we're going to be able to look after ourselves. Mm -hmm. Failure to do so, there's going to come a time when the imports are not there and we're going to be struggling. You know why? It takes, at quickest, six weeks to three months to produce food in you know, unprocessed raw state. So if we wait until we have a crisis, then we're really going to be in problems. What are your thoughts, Mr. Nisbet, about this in terms of prioritizing local yeah. produce? I support what Mr. said. But over the years that I'm in farming, mm -hmm. I have looked forward to hear someone in authority say, let us choose a product that we can successfully grow and work with that as a start. Take, for instance, carrots. Carrots can go easy in St. Kitts, especially in the rainy season. And I had some carrots recently, and I was told that the big supermarkets do not import carrots. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't buy them at all, not from, 
fortunately for whatever happened, well, we had carrots. Uh, other farmers had to go at it quite a bit too. And we sold them because there was no shipment from where they get them from. So they were forced to buy them and we all sold them off. All farmers did mm -hmm. very well out of them. Mm -hmm. But then they keep importing. I had to explain to someone that do you know that the carrots you buy in the supermarket might have been produced in 2021? Because they harvested them before the autumn. Because when the winter comes, will, it will kill them. And they treat them and refrigerate them. And then, after you ever notice that when they come here, some of them are already shooting at the top. That's how long they've been stored. So they have very little food value in them. Mm. And they say, you know, you're right. But yet, they prefer them already washed and packaged. Mm -hmm. So throw them in the pot, let's let that all day. Mm -hmm. Wash them off and grate them. I see and the that's what they do. I see um, the Ms. Clark, if I can, Dr. Clark. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> if I, I, don't, I don't want to be very controversial, you know. But um, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, what, what Mr. Nisbet said is so relevant. It is something that farmers have been calling for yeah. for years. I, as director, at one time, I had called, I had drawn up a list of 25 farmers and said, look, let's aim initially at about five crops. In my most recent stint with the department as an advisor, I again revised the project and submitted it to the, the Ministry of Agriculture, the PS, to be exact. Um, carrots was one of the things that we, thought we looked at. And the idea, basic, simple. Get a number of farmers, get their commitment. Um, if we get them to commit to 2% of the imports, mm -hmm. that is what we're going to produce, just 2%. You already have the farmer's commitment. And then we must now go to the supermarkets and get a reduction of 2%. Um, you could either negotiate with them or the, the WTO has mechanisms in place where you can put certain trade regulations to allow that. And that is what was being proposed. Unfortunately, um, it was not accepted by the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, but the, the truth is, we cannot continue the status quo as is, right? It is to our detriment. And so sometimes we have to take decisions. And I, you know, it was very disappointing that um, the, the Ministry of Agriculture didn't see it fit. Just as I noticed we don't have anyone from the Ministry of Agriculture here tonight discussing the invasive alien species either. And I know that the Ministry has withdrawn its support from the project. And um, in truth and in fact, the, 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 the monies allocated to the ministry is over 700,000 US dollars. And um, I, I don't know what will happen to that input, but in truth and in fact, monkey is such a problem that we're saying. And here is the, the Ministry of Agriculture, the, the, the food end of it, who is so critical and who has not found it convenient to be a part of the project. Um, we cannot as a country be wasting resources like that, we cannot as a country be taking decisions which are very deleterious to our own survival. We, we need to be a lot more smart, we need to be a lot more, as it were, on the ball. With, when, when we work so hard to get funds from Jeff, when we work so hard to get international funds, which are so competitive, then we need to be use, using them um, in, in, a, in a sustainable and in a meaningful manner. So we see that the Ministry of Agriculture, it's never perfect, but I think in very recent times, they have even been dropping the ball in, in far more significant ways than in the past and in ways which are not improving our agriculture, nor our situation, but in fact worsening it. And for me, that is really a pity. Right. So I want to read another comment from our social media feed, and it's simple. 
I stopped eating carrots. That was a comment after you mentioned that we are eating carrots that, you know, will produce for so long. And the but Dr. Clark, but Dr. Clark, um, if we continue to give the examples, then it will work for local. Right. Because listen, the chicken, a lot of the chicken that we get, the fresh chicken, they're one year old, you know. <laughs> if you go and you take the fresh, I tell people, you go and you take the fresh um, grapes, fresh grapes, but the stem is dry. You know how long it takes to get a stem dry in a fridge? That's how old they are. You take an orange, sometimes you cut the orange, the, the pegs are um, the, the missing in fluid. I'm, I'm losing the word now. They have to be very old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, these things that we're importing, they are third class things. Mm -hmm. And that is why sometimes they cost less than the local, fresh, high quality. But, but, but we're getting better value. We know because we are obese, mm -hmm. we have a lot of health and nutritional related problems. So we must be able to conclude that the present food sources are not the best for us. Mm -hmm. We just need to get our governments to do the right thing and let's begin to develop a proper mm -hmm. agricultural program and reduce the invasives and all those kind of things which cause reduction in biodiversity and reduction in productivity. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing, what we're hearing here today is a need for policy changes, for Certainly. signing on to the right trade agreements, and also for promoting a healthier lifestyle so we could manage it. And, and imagine, we started talking about invasive alien species and monkeys and threat to food security. And now we're seeing how all these global issues are related. Uh, obesity, non-communicable lifestyle diseases, be having access to healthy food, ensuring that we support our farmers because their produce is essentially what is needed for food security. So we're going to wrap up because most of our questions came from social media. And our final question here, which we'll all give briefly, What's the future for monkey management and food security in St. Kitts and Nevis? So I'll allow Doc, we'll, we'll close with, our farmer, we'll start with Dr. Doerr. Sure. So because monkeys were identified as the most problematic IAS by the country, we set up the whole project really around that. So we want to talk about our other IAS and the problems that they cause. But our main output as I alluded to earlier, is a scientifically informed monkey management strategy. So this data that we've been collecting for me over 12 years and as part of the project for the last three to four years on the monkeys is going to be integrated through these economists' programs to help us actually do cost-benefit analysis. So we're pricing out the different strategies that could be used, culling, sterilization, electric fencing, Right, we're actually costing these things out. And these folks who have done invasive species management around the world can help us identify the smartest pathway moving forward. So you can expect to see that by the end of the calendar year. And that will be publicly viewable. So we'll be sure to be sharing that with everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Doerr. Mr. James, your final comment? Publicly, I want to thank Dr. Kerry Doerr for making Sink It's a Home and um, doing so much work with um, these monkeys. I also want to encourage a lot more of us locals. Um, the, the more intelligence we bring to the field, the more solutions we can find. So a lot more of us need to take up careers in relation to wildlife, soil conservation, agriculture, this kind of thing. We're not going to make agriculture successful if we leave it up just to the ordinary farmer. So we really need to bring a lot of our own gray matter to bear on these issues, and that is how we're going to be able to go forward in technology, in IT, and that kind of thing, especially around agriculture. We cannot afford to slacken. We just have to keep pressing on. And as insurmountable as it seems, we have to find solutions. It's about survival. We are resilient people. We can and we will get it done. Yes, thank you. Mr. Nisman. Yeah. I would like to say and close in that in order to control and manage the monkey better, one needs to be always on his farm. He should be a farmer, not a part-time farmer. And that will help a lot because 
even if you have a gun and you are a farmer and you wait for monkeys to come and you shoot some monkeys out of a tube, well, as long as you are on your farm, the monkeys will not come because they know you have a gun. And that's the only one of the means you can really catch them. So you have to be a farmer, not a bus driver or a farmer, a teacher or a farmer, and that kind of thing, because you don't have the time to manage monkeys there. And you have to be there. People have dogs, and dogs, sometimes the monkey and the dog become friends. Like you say, monkey and the dog become <laughs> friends. And they, while they let you, they eat and they go on. Thank you so much. Now, as we close, I want to remind you that you can follow the Department of Environment on our various social media feeds. The Department of Environment, St. Kitts and Nevis, D on IG, it's D-O-E-S-K-N. On Facebook, it's at Enviro S-K-N. And on Twitter, it's at D-O-E-S-K-N. Now, that wraps our session for tonight. We have spent an hour and a half here talking about Green Monkey, food security, biodiversity, sustainable development goals, the, even the war in Ukraine and in the war between Ukraine and Russia, and all of these are linked to how we protect our islands from invasive alien species. We have our promotional work here. It's detect, declare, protect. And finally, to everyone who's coming home this weekend, remember, you can play your part in protecting our island against invasive alien species. Detect, declare, and protect. Have a good night, everyone. St. Kitts and Nevis is currently one of seven island countries participating in the sub-regional project preventing costs of invasive alien species in Barbados and the OECS countries. The African green monkey was picked as the invasive species of focus for the invasive species initiative due to hundreds of years of reports of the animal's negative impact to our agricultural economy. They have been with us here in the Federation some 400 years. They populated themselves not having any natural enemies. And over the years, they continued to feed on the natural flora and fauna. We at one point had a native finch, the St. Kitts bullfinch, which has now gone extinct. And it's rumored that the monkeys were critical in the extirpation of the species. We need to get the population down while we're gonna starve. We're gonna starve big time if it doesn't get the population down. And many more people are recognizing that they also need to eat, that they're trying to meet their basic needs as well. And I think that that has really helped shape this project and helped us understand that when we're creating a management strategy, we need to be considering both the animals' ecological impact, their agricultural impact, but also the fact that they're part of the country, part of our culture, and, and respecting them as well.